People never talk about this. One of the most interesting periods of Japanese animation history is the very early years. Before established studios and techniques, the industry was a free-for-all of experimentation. Mixed in with the troubles of a world war, these initial years are fascinating and very rarely discussed. Which is a great shame because lots of animators and directors that work during this period are disregarded in discussion about anime history. Directors that are pivotal to the birth of anime. The birth of Japanese animation can be dated back to the beginning of the 20th century well over 100 years ago. Unfortunately, little work from this period has survived, some films having only been discovered a number of years ago. These were either artistic tests or commercial work. Many commissioned films exist in company records but not in a viewable form. In 2004, a film reel was found and distributed online as Katsuro Shasen. Experts dated it back to 1907, which if true makes it the oldest known piece of Japanese animation. Containing only 50 frames, it's not a huge stylistic insight, but it certainly has historical importance. There are a number of films in the following decade too that are unfortunately lost in history. An artist at the time, Uten Shimokawa, is responsible for many of these films. He was a cartoonist for a magazine at the time and created five short animated movies in 1917, just as experiments. But again, we don't have any footage of these. Although one year later, we do have footage of Urashima Taro, a short film that was found in an antique shop in 2008. Instead of cell animation that would be used in later decades, these works were made from cutout animation. This is when animators would literally cut out shapes and move them between each frame. There was obviously no sound or colour and very limited movements, but these relics give us an insight into where future styles started. Up until the later 1920s, animators had no way of getting their projects funded. There was just no demand for Japanese animation. Disney films could be imported in and played for a fraction of the cost. But around the mid-20s, Japanese animation started to gain traction. One of the most prolific and important names of the period is Noboru Ufuji, a director who became extremely interested in animation as a medium and started to produce short films. Ufuji's early work consists of him experimenting with basic movement, using primarily cutout animation. He would animate various characters in front of backgrounds to tell simple stories. One of his early works that really fascinated me was the National Anthem in 1931. He became interested in German shadow puppet animation and created this film. The movement is smoother than cutout animation, but even more limited. What I liked was how well the silhouette effect excelled in certain areas. It created an eerie atmosphere and some awesome psychedelic imagery that was rare at the time. It's one of the earliest works that I felt an artistic connection with, and it's really interesting to see the various avenues directors were experimenting with here. A few years later, in 1934, Kenzo Masaoka made one of the medium's most important movements. He created the Chagama Ondo, the first fully cell animated anime. This was a big step forward for Japan in terms of catching up with western animation and allowing for much higher quality movement. Many animators still use cell animation today, and modern digital animation is based off of this technique. Chigama Ondo was two short films featuring a group of tanukis exploring a temple. The style is typical of the time, lots of bold curved lines and circular movement, and there was no real camera movement. Masaoka would set up a static background and have characters move around it like a play, but the animation was impressive for its time, mimicking the style of Disney. Later in 1935 we have Norakuro, which was the first manga adaptation, a format that would become an industry standard later on. This was directed by Matsuya Seo, who became one of the most important individuals in the industry. The film featured a lot more movement and elements outside of character designs. We would get subtle camera pans and perspective shots. Seo created this in the style of a cartoon or a short film, rather than the previous works that looked more like comic strips or theatre plays. Norakuro seemed different thematically from a lot of work as well. It's not an old folk tale told with animals, it's more commercial, which is a nice change. Seo was revolutionary once again in 1941 with his short film Arichan. He was the first director in Japan to fully utilise the multiplane camera technology, something that Disney were once again already utilising. This is the plan for a super cartoon camera. We call it the multiplane camera. It allowed an unbelievable amount of extra depth to their animation. Arichan had a real sense of a 3D perspective, having characters move in all directions instead of just left and right. As you might have realised, Seo was hugely influenced by Disney. His use of chirpy orchestral music, with movement that moved in sync with the sounds, and his round animal character designs, they were all influenced by Disney's work in the 30s. Seo was one of the first animators to really start pursuing the competition, and Arichan is a great example of the progression Japanese animators were making. 
I mentioned earlier that directors found it hard to find funding for movies. Well, now they had an option. The Japanese government were actively funding films, but there was a very strict set of rules on, on what was allowed to be made. A lot of these became propaganda films. Kenzo Masuoka returned in 1943 to create one of the first examples of this, Kumo to Tulip a 15 minute short film about a spider chasing a ladybird. Like I said, the thematic content of these films were influenced by the government, and looking back now seem to have strong racial and nationalistic undertones, but that doesn't mean the film's technical achievements can be ignored. The animation is some of Japan's most complex so far, with character designs seeming three-dimensional and backgrounds having a more realistic tone. Depth of field was used strongly here to give the insect world a sense of scale. The ladybird's character design is important to note too. You can see the distinct resemblance to what would later be the standard anime character look. Japanese animation was progressing faster than ever. Seo then directed two groundbreaking films, Mamatoro's Sea Eagles in 1943 and Mamatoro's Divine Sea Warriors in 1945. These were essentially propaganda films that showed the Japanese military beating foreign forces. But Divine Sea Warriors is incredibly important as it was Japan's first ever feature length anime film. And it wasn't just blatant propaganda. Although Seo was commissioned by the military, he instilled themes of hope, encouraging a younger generation to dream positively. The movie was telling a unique story and it was a huge milestone in the development of Japanese animation. Audio was still in its infancy, but movement was smooth and Seo incorporated a dynamic range of camera work. Again, the character designs were heavily influenced by Disney, but the beginnings of anime's distinct style were there. Seo even started to animate background elements and used the multiplane camera to enormous effect. Divine Sea Warriors is this period's peak. Animation in Japan had gone from scarcely animated comic strips to complex feature films that were beginning to rival their foreign counterparts, and even more exciting technology was just around the corner. But after the war, the rate of animation production in Japan plummeted. It would take years before a similar level of progression would be matched. Directors like Noboru Ufuji and Kenzo Masaoka would continue to work on anime, but many others including the legendary Matsuo Seo were forced out of the industry by a lack of work. Ufuji's work took a very dark turn, for example his film Kumo no Ito in 1946. It showcased a bunch of really creepy body movement, with imagery of humans being burned in what seemed like a depiction of hell, again with the returning spider imagery. Seo did complete one film after the war, but couldn't find a distributor to release it. After that, he never returned to anime. With the forefathers of Japanese animation growing old and the industry seemingly drying up, it seemed the medium was doomed. In 1948, Kenzo Masaoka and film producer Zenjiro Yamamoto tried to hold on to their fleeting medium by forming an animation studio. Unfortunately, they didn't receive any substantial work until almost a decade later where a company named Toei purchased the studio. They started production on the wildly important Haku Jaden, the first ever fully colour anime film. It was even released in America a few years later. Haku Jaden is responsible for reviving an almost perished industry, establishing Toei Productions and the system of anime studios and inspired the next wave of animators and directors. Stylistically, the film was completely different from the previous anime works, instead looking more like traditional oriental paintings than its wartime predecessors. Although work had been scarce over the last 10 years, the skills of animators had still improved and complex objects full of colour and depth were being animated. It was one of the first time realistic humans had been depicted too, rather than just basic animals. It felt a lot closer to the overseas competition, with colour inviting a welcomed atmosphere. I don't think Haku Jaden was as well directed as previous anime projects though. A lot of the compositions and camera movements seemed very basic, usually just panning back and forward instead of utilising a 3D perspective. Regardless, anime needed this and it kickstarted the industry again. The next few years saw various small animation projects broadcast on TV rather than cinemas. Things like Otage Manga Calendar were short stories that would be sprinkled throughout a network. But in 1961, an individual named Osama Tezuka, who had been working at Toei saw a brighter future. He formed his own studio, Mushi Productions, with the goal of making anime a TV industry. He released Astro Boy in 1963 and it changed the whole game. This single series created the template that every anime would follow for the next 60 years and opened the floodgates for the TV anime industry. Tezuka drew inspiration from works like Momotoro and Haku Jaden to establish his style, a style that would be the basis for the next 60 years of anime. 
Tezuka had a dream of making anime a global medium and rivaling Disney. Astro Boy was the perfect start for this dream. Japanese animation explodes into a stylistic melting pot after this and new genres and creators start to appear every year. You can see more into what happened next in another video I've made, uh, the stylistic evolution of anime that looks more into the following decades. But I hope this video has given you an idea of where it all came from and, and who the practitioners were that kickstarted the whole medium. I'm working on loads of exciting videos coming up in the next coming weeks so please do make sure you're subscribed and keeping an eye on the channel. And thanks to everyone that's contributed to the channel with viewing the videos, clicking the like button and leaving comments. It's really appreciated. And be sure to follow me on social media, things like Twitter and Facebook are great ways to connect. But thank you very much for watching this video.